All right, guys. Well, let's move on to chapter three of Peruvian Plunge. For those of you still sticking with me here, chapter three titled The Great Peccary Hunt. A peccary is the Latin American version of a wild pig. That's what these things are. <clears throat> We're going to start out with a quote from Amazon Up Close by Pamela Bloom. Few animals that live in the dense forest are as feared as peccaries, whose sharp, knife-edged tusks have forced many a local up a tree for hours. We are now at Sunday, May 24th, 2009. Uh, outside of Atalaya, Peru. <clears throat> the arrival of a lovely mist-shrouded Sunday dawn offered renewed hopes that Saturday's cultural lumberjacks would turn out to be hardcore Catholics and would therefore join the Lord in a day of rest from exercising their dominion over the earth that God had worked so hard all week to create. Planting that optimistic seed in my karma bank, I trudged uphill to the kitchen to prepare a breakfast of potatoes and coffee while a groggy merino reclined in his hammock to recover from his tough morning of fire building. We had fallen into an unspoken agreement that merino would use his Stone Age talents to coax flame out of soggy, half-rotten firewood while yours truly handled all the open-fire cooking chores, no doubt as penance for refusing to bring a cylinder of propane with me. Over breakfast, I conferred and confirmed with Marino, upside down and backwards, that there was indeed, as he had assured me the day before, a beautiful waterfall in the remote Peeny Peeny River Canyon, a two-hour walk from where we now sat. He assured me again that was the case, but I added an extra hour each way to compensate for my gringo snail's pace just in case. The truth be told, I was actually savoring the thought of a relaxing Sunday in the hammock since it appeared we were going to spend the... <clears throat> We were going to be spared the assault of the infernal chainsaws from hell. I had not been settled into my hammock for five minutes when Gideon's trumpet cranked up again and destroyed my peaceful Sunday morning. That settled it. It was off to the Rio Pini Pini for Marino and me. <clears throat> We started out on the same steep, muddy trail we had used the day before, but when that well-worn track veered off to the left <clears throat> to the level ridge line, Marino, rubber boots on his feet, an omnipresent machete in hand, forged ahead up the almost vertical mountainside, following some faint trail that only a true Stone Age Indian such as he could see through the thick vegetation. Huffing and puffing and sweating like a South Georgia mule before 9 a.m., the barefooted gringo worked hard to keep up with the Olympic pace. We would no sooner reach the top of one ridge than, without a rest, we would plunge down the other side and lose all the elevation we had just gained. At the bottom of each ravine would be a muddy, a muddy slippery creek crossing to negotiate. <clears throat> Onward we marched into the growing heat of the day. I had no watch and therefore no way to keep time, but I figured we must be about halfway to the waterfall when we emerged at a small weed-choked lake tucked away in the jungle. A swarm of giant electric blue morpho butterflies cavorted on a little beach at the water's edge. I actually convinced Marino to sit his ass down on a log to rest for a grand total of three minutes, but before I'd had a chance to get my pulse back down to 120 beats per minute, 
my indefatigable jungle guide was back on his feet again. The section of trail above the lake was the most grueling of all, and Ernesto's sarcastic description of whiny gringos came back to haunt me. Seconds before I was to capitulate to the stereotype and become a whiny gringo myself, we arrived at the top of the steep ridge. Marino flung his arms out grandly and announced, Salvacion! I was hoping and praying that his definition of salvation meant a bar serving ice-cold cerveza and 55-gallon drums. Not that I had one soul to pay for it, of course, but instead it referred to a mountaintop mirador overlooking the frontier town of Salvacion, Peru, some six miles farther down the highway from Atalaya. I exaggerated my interest in the view of this dreary, jungle-eating town below us for as long as I could get away with it, but my intrepid guide indicated the day was disappearing fast. We plunged down the other side of the near-vertical ravine. Perhaps five minutes into the pace-jarring descent, Marino stopped suddenly and motioned to me to be quiet. Pecalis! Muchos pecalis, he whispered excited, excitedly. For the first time, I saw a true Stone Age glint in his noble savage eyes. It said, fuck rice and beans for dinner. Tonight, we're having barbecued ribs. Of course, I neither saw, heard, nor smelled anything that would indicate muchos pecalis much less barbecued pork for dinner, but I obediently dropped down on the ground with him as he diagrammed out his plan of attack. First, we had to confirm that this illicit bushmeat raid was to be kept top secret from his boss, Dante, who expressly forbade hunting on his property. I zipped my lips to assure him of my confidence. Since Dante also did not allow bows and arrows, spears, or blowguns on his property, I asked my Stone Age companion exactly how he planned to bring down one of the 80-pound tusked brutes. Piedra, he whispered. Stone. Stone? As in a rock? Man! When they call these uncontacted dudes Stone Age hunters, they aren't kidding. When Marino kicked off his rubber boots and threw down his machete, it hit me that this lunatic seriously intended to kill one of the most feared beasts of the jungle with a rock. Worse, the lunatic gringo with him was going along for the ride. With pure singularity of focus, the seasoned hunter shot out into the trackless jungle, leaving his machete and all traces of the trail behind him and me. Although I still had no clue what secret signal he was following to, to find the elusive wild pigs, I did my best to keep his backside inside as I stumbled along behind him in my bumbling, barefooted, gringo way. Within seconds, we were completely swallowed up in the surrounding vegetation. Racing to keep up with Marino, I finally began to hear the muffled snorts and grunts of the herd. Although they were impossible to see, it sounded like there were dozens of them spread out through the forest, concentrated mostly at the bottom of a steep ravine, perhaps a hundred yards ahead. I caught up with my fearless, brainless companion, where he was crouching behind a fern-covered fallen log, surveying the situation and contemplating his next move. The huge herd of pigs 
Marino whispered there were probably more than 100 of them, was now barely 10 yards from us. But the plant life was so riotous in the ravine that all I could make out were a few eerie shadows flitting through the dark forest as the herd passed by. More chilling than the shadows themselves was the ominous clacking of the boar's sharp three-inch tusks, those teeth that cast such fear into the hearts of gringo jungle visitors, and there were no doubt dozens of sets of those incisors waiting to shred me to pieces. The herd munched away, totally oblivious to our presence. My Stone Age companion picked up a softball-sized stone from the ground. Still crouching, we left the dubious fortress of the log and inched our way forward. The devilish tusk clacking and snorting sounded like it was right in my ears. The musky stench of pig shit filled my nostrils, and the spongy ground itself was quaking beneath my feet from the army of hooves. Yet the maddening curtain of rainforest flora was so thick that I could catch only stray glimpses of peccary flank right in front of me, with no signal whatsoever that I could detect from the oblivious peccaries, Marino suddenly sprang up from his crouch and lobbed the rock into the mass of shadows like it was the bottom of the ninth, winning run on third, and two outs and two strikes. There was a dull thud, followed by a loud surprise shriek, then all hell broke loose in the jungle as a terrified herd of squealing peccaries stampeded off into the forest in all directions. No doubt yours truly looked every bit like a panicked peccary myself as I beat a hasty retreat back to the sanctuary of the fallen log, as if that was really going to save my ass from a dozen enraged wild boars. <clears throat> Pointing at the wild-eyed expression on my flustered gringo face, Marino hooted with laughter from atop the log. That Stone Age SOB, he knew damn well all along that he had zero chance of killing a peccary with a fucking rock. He simply wanted to see the look on my face to tell his buddies a funny story back in his village. The great peccary hunt behind us, we now face the much more serious and real challenge of finding our way back out to the trail and more importantly to Marino's evolutionarily superior machete. We had come perhaps 300 yards from our starting point, but you could not see more than three yards in any direction. As far as I was concerned, it was a 360 degree crapshoot. Where was a damn GPS when you needed one? I realized with more than a twinge of anxiety that my guide, who had only been living at Dante's for six weeks himself, had never in his entire life stood where we were standing, and he had probably only been on the trail itself a time or two. Recovering from his laughter at his hilarious practical joke, Marino set off into the forest as confidently as if he was setting off down a city sidewalk for a stroll to the corner convenience store. I was unable to detect the slightest hint of a footprint or broken twig as Marino pushed on through the vegetation without his trusty machete to aid him. Two minutes later, we emerged directly at the spot where we had left the trail 15 minutes earlier. By this time, 
the day was slipping away from us, Marino did some quick calculations on his fingers and announced that at this pathetic glacial gringo pace, it would be well into the afternoon before he even reached the waterfall. Reluctantly, I capitulated to return to the lodge. Inexplic inexplicably, he insisted that we forge on poquito mas, a little bit more. His idea of a poquito mas turned out to be another kilometer or so of slipping and sliding or our way down one hillside, sloshing through a deep, a steep banked muddy stream and pushing our way up one final mountainside that would have made a llama long for a cold beer. I had no clue at this point what it was that Marino was so hell-bent on showing me. This mad rush to the middle of nowhere ended up appropriately enough in the geographical center of the middle of nowhere, where Marino astounded me by showing me a pile of 90-pound bags of cement, which had, of course, been turned into six useless 90-pound rocks by the recent rains and a bunch of tin roofing. I never solved the mystery of what these enigmatic construction materials were intended for or if Marino was the beast of burden who had carried them to this rem remote location, which would have been a Herculean task of inhuman proportions. The mystery of the cement only deepened the insoluble riddle of how loggers years ago had managed to scrape this rugged landscape clean of every single tree bigger than a telephone pole without the benefit of a road and more importantly without benefit of trucks. Helicopters? Levitation? The remote ridge top clearing for the future construction project at least offered me my first glimpse of the elusive and remote Peeny Peeny River peering through my binoculars into the steep jungle canyon a mile or more below as I was distressed, though not surprised, to discover the banks of the protected river dotted with bright blue tarpaulins, the ubiquitous sign of loggers, miners, and squatters burrowing deeper and deeper into Manu's cultural zone. Five or so miles beyond the Rio Pini Pini, I can make out the cancerous human antil of Pilcapata eating its way like so many lines of leaf cutter ants deeper and deeper into the jungle in all directions. How many more years, I wondered, before Pilcapata, Atalaya, and Salvacion would become one solid 10-mile string of slums spread out along a barren paved highway I mulled over these depressing questions as Marino and I munched our nutritious lunch of Oreos and rested up for our afternoon march back home. The first hints of darkness were already settling into the shadowy world beneath the canopy when we began our final descent down the steep hillside behind the house. I was so exhausted from the day's sweaty workout that I wondered if I would ever survive making and cooking dinner. It was at this late point in the day that Marino set to work with his machete, chopping up a naturally fallen tree into manageable two-foot sections. As I chopped carrots and onions in the kitchen, I could hear the steady thwock, thwock, of metal against wood, a sound in some ways even more chilling than the rattle of peccary tusks, 
or the aggravated screams of chainsaws. I was just pulling supper off the fire when Marino came dragging in from the mountainside with a back-breaking load of wet firewood tied together with jungle vines <coughs> that would have given a burrow shin splints. We ate together in exhausted near silence as twilight descended over the Madre de Dios River, savoring every sweet drop of our piña coladas. After dinner, I snuck off for a surreptitious bowl while Marino checked out his first taste of Bonnie Rate on my Sony Walkman. Through the darkness, I could hear his occasional attempts to harmonize with the Gringa Blues Rocker. Tiring of trying to sing along with Bonnie, Marino hauled his weary ass back to his own sleeping quarters. The last sound I heard as I drifted off to sleep under a blanket of Peruvian stars was the haunting melody of some Stone Age Masha Gwenga Indian song accompanied by the sound of what I imagined to be some primitive form of flute. This was, after all, still Peru and the primitive flute capital of the world. Okay. I think we made it through. Coming up with more about that primitive flute next chapter.